The Kronstadt Rebellion Russian, Kronstadtskoi Vostani TR. was a major unsuccessful uprising against the Bolsheviks in March 1921, during the later years of the Russian Civil War. Led by Stepan Petrichenko and consisting of Russian sailors, soldiers, and civilians, the rebellion was one of the reasons for Vladimir Lenin's and the Communist Party's decision to loosen its control of the Russian economy by implementing the New Economic Policy .The rebellion originated in Kronstadt, a naval fortress on Kotlin Island in the Gulf of Finland that served as the base of the Russian Baltic Fleet and as a guard post for the approaches to Petrograd, 55 kilometers 34 miles away. The rebellion was crushed by the Red Army after a 12-day military campaign, resulting in several thousand deaths. According to Lenin, the crisis was the most critical the regime had yet faced, "...undoubtedly more dangerous than Denikin, Udenik, and Kolchak combined." <laughs> Economic background By 1921, the Bolsheviks were winning the Russian Civil War and foreign troops were beginning to withdraw, yet Bolshevik leaders continued to keep tight control of the economy through the policy of war communism. After years of economic crises caused by World War I and the Russian Civil War, the Bolshevik economy started to collapse. Industrial output had fallen dramatically. It is estimated that the total output of mines and factories in 1921 was 20% of the pre-World War I level, with many crucial items suffering an even more drastic decline. Production of cotton, for example, had fallen to 5% and iron to 2% of the pre-war level, and this coincided with droughts in 1920 and 1921 and the Russian famine of 1921. Discontent grew among the Russian populace, particularly the peasantry, who felt disadvantaged by communist grain requisitioning forced seizure of large portions of the peasants' grain crop used to feed urban dwellers. They resisted by refusing to till their land. In February 1921, more than 100 peasant uprisings took place. The workers in Petrograd were also involved in a series of strikes, caused by the reduction of bread rations by one-third over a ten-day period. Topic. Petropavlovsk Resolution On February 26, delegates from the Kronstadt naval base visited Petrograd to investigate the situation. On February 28, in response to the delegates' report of heavy-handed Bolshevik repression of strikes in Petrograd, the crews of the battleships Petropavlovsk and Sevastopol held an emergency meeting, which approved a resolution raising 15 demands. Immediate new elections to the Soviets, the present Soviets no longer express the wishes of the workers and peasants. The new elections should be held by secret ballot, and should be preceded by free electoral propaganda for all workers and peasants before the elections. Freedom of speech and of the press for workers and peasants, for the anarchists, and for the left socialist parties. The right of assembly, and freedom for trade union and peasant associations. The organization, at the latest on 10 March 1921, of a conference of non-party workers, soldiers and sailors of Petrograd, Kronstadt and the Petrograd district. The liberation of all political prisoners of the socialist parties, and of all imprisoned workers and peasants, soldiers and sailors belonging to working class and peasant organizations. The election of a commission to look into the dossiers of all those detained in prisons and concentration camps. The abolition of all political sections in the armed forces, no political party should have privileges for the propagation of its ideas, or receive state subsidies to this end. In place of the political section, various cultural groups should be set up, deriving resources from the state. The immediate abolition of the militia detachments set up between towns and countryside. The equalization of rations for all workers, except those engaged in dangerous or unhealthy jobs. The abolition of party combat detachments in all military groups, the abolition of party guards in factories and enterprises. If guards are required, they should be nominated, taking into account the views of the workers. The granting to the peasants of freedom of action on their own soil, and of the right to own cattle, provided they look after them themselves and do not employ hired labor. We request that all military units and officer trainee groups associate themselves with this resolution. We demand that the press give proper publicity to this resolution. We demand the institution of mobile workers' control groups. 
We demand that handicraft production be authorized, provided it does not utilize wage labor. On March 1, a general meeting of the garrison was held, attended also by Mikhail Kalinin and Commissar of the Soviet Baltic Fleet Nikolai Kuzmin, who made speeches for the government, threatening harsh repression if the requests were not withdrawn. The general meeting passed a resolution including the 15 demands given above. On March 2, a conference of sailor, soldier and worker organization delegates, after hearing speeches by Kuzmin and Vasiliev, president of the Kronstadt Executive Committee, arrested these two and approved the formation of a provisional revolutionary committee. The government responded with an ultimatum the same day, which insinuated that the revolt had undoubtedly been prepared by French counterintelligence, and that the Petropavlovsk resolution was an senior black hundred resolution. Senior stood for Social Revolutionaries, a socialist party whose right wing had refused to support the Bolsheviks. The Black Hundreds were an ultranationalist paramilitary organization in late Tsarist Russia, whose members had opposed any retreat from Tsarist autocracy. After the October Revolution, Black Hundreds became a term of abuse for real and imagined anti-communists. <laughs> Suppression of the revolt The Bolshevik government began its attack on Kronstadt on March 7. Some 60,000 troops under command of Mikhail Tukhachevsky took part in the attack. The workers of Petrograd were under martial law. There was a hurry to gain control of the fortress before the thawing of the frozen bay, as it would have made it impregnable for the land army. On March 17, Bolshevik forces entered the city of Kronstadt after having suffered over 10,000 fatalities. On March 19, the Bolshevik forces took full control of the city of Kronstadt after having suffered fatalities ranging from 527 to 1,412 or much higher if the toll from the first assault is included. The day after the surrender of Kronstadt, the Bolsheviks celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Paris Commune. Although there are no reliable figures for rebel battle losses, historians estimate that from 1,200 to 2,168 persons were executed after the revolt and a similar number were jailed, many in the Solovka prison camp. Official Soviet figures claim approximately 1,000 rebels were killed, 2,000 wounded and from 2,300 to 6,528 captured, with 6,000 to 8,000 defecting to Finland, while the Red Army lost 527 killed and 3,285 wounded. Later on, 1,050–1,272 prisoners were freed and 750–1,486 sentenced to five years forced labor. More fortunate rebels were those who escaped to Finland, their large number causing the first big refugee problem for the newly independent state. The Soviet government later provided the refugees in Finland with amnesty, among those was Petrachenko, who lived in Finland and worked as a spy for the Soviet Gosudarstvenoi Politischiskoi Upravleni He was arrested by the Finnish authorities in 1941 and was expelled to the Soviet Union in 1944. Some months after his return, he was arrested on espionage charges and sentenced to ten years in prison, and died at Vladimir Prison in 1947. Although Red Army units suppressed the uprising, dissatisfaction with the state of affairs could not have been more forcefully expressed. Vladimir Lenin stated that Kronstadt lit up reality like a lightning flash. Against this background of discontent, Lenin concluded that world revolution was not imminent. In the spring of 1921, he replaced war communism with his new economic policy. Topic charges of international and counter revolutionary involvement claims that the Kronstadt uprising was instigated by foreign and counter revolutionary forces extended beyond the March 2 government ultimatum. The anarchist Emma Goldman, who was in Petrograd at the time of the rebellion, described in a retrospective account from 1938 how the news in the Paris press about the Kronstadt uprising two weeks before it happened had been stressed in the official press campaign against the sailors as proof positive that they had been tools of the imperialist gang and that rebellion had actually been hatched in Paris. It was too obvious that this yarn was used only to discredit the Kronstadters in the eyes of the workers. In 1970, the historian Paul Average published a comprehensive history of the rebellion, including analysis of evidence of the involvement of anti Bolshevik emigre groups. An appendix to Average's history included a document titled Memorandum on the Question of Organizing an Uprising in Kronstadt, the original of which was located in the Russian Archive of Columbia University, today called the Bakhmetov Archive of Russian and East European Culture. 
Average says this memorandum was probably written between January and early February 1921 by an agent of an exile opposition group called the National Center in Finland. The memorandum has become a touchstone in debates about the rebellion. Those debates started at the time of the rebellion. Because Leon Trotsky was in charge of the Red Army forces that suppressed the uprising, with the backing of Lenin, the question of whether the suppression was justified became a point of contention on the revolutionary left. In debates between anarchists and Leninist Marxists about the character of the Soviet state and Leninist politics, and more particularly in debates between anarchists and Trotsky and his followers. It remains so to this day. On the pro-Leninist side of those debates, the memorandum published by Average is treated as a smoking gun showing foreign and counter-revolutionary conspiracy behind the rebellion, for example in an article from 1990 by a Trotskyist writer, Abby Bakken. Bakken says T he document includes remarkably detailed information about the resources, personnel, arms and plans of the Kronstadt rebellion. It also details plans regarding White Army and French government support for the Kronstadt Sailors March Rebellion. Bakken says the National Center originated in 1918 as a self described underground organization formed in Russia for the struggle against the Bolsheviks. After being infiltrated by the Bolshevik Cheka secret police, the group suffered the arrest and execution of many of its central members, and was forced to reconstitute itself in exile. Bakken links the National Center to the White Army General Wrangel, who had evacuated an army of 70 or 80,000 troops to Turkey in late 1920. However, Average says that the memorandum probably was composed by a National Center agent in Finland. Average reaches a different conclusion as to the meaning of the memorandum. R. Eating the document quickly shows that Kronstadt was not a product of a white conspiracy but rather that the white National Center aimed to try and use a spontaneous uprising it thought was likely to erupt there in the coming spring for its own ends. The report notes that among the sailors, numerous and unmistakable signs of mass dissatisfaction with the existing order can be noticed. Indeed, the memorandum states that one must not forget that even if the French command and the Russian anti-Bolshevik organizations do not take part in the preparation and direction of the uprising, a revolt in Kronstadt will take place all the same during the coming spring, but after a brief period of success it will be doomed to failure." Average rejects the idea that the memorandum explains the revolt. Nothing has come to light to show that the secret memorandum was ever put into practice or that any links had existed between the émigrés and the sailors before the revolt. On the contrary, the rising bore the earmarks of spontaneity. There was little in the behavior of the rebels to suggest any careful advance preparation. Had there been a prearranged plan, surely the sailors would have waited a few weeks longer for the ice to melt. The rebels, moreover, allowed Kalinin a leading communist to return to Petrograd, though he would have made a valuable hostage. Further, no attempt was made to take the offensive. Significant, too, is the large number of communists who took part in the movement. The sailors needed no outside encouragement to raise the banner of insurrection. Kronstadt was clearly ripe for a rebellion. What set it off was not the machination of émigré conspirators and foreign intelligence agents but the wave of peasant risings throughout the country and the labor disturbances in neighboring Petrograd. And as the revolt unfolded, it followed the pattern of earlier outbursts against the central government from 1905 through the Civil War. Moreover, whether the memorandum played a part in the revolt can be seen from the reactions of the white national center to the uprising. Firstly, they failed to deliver aid to the rebels or to get French aid to them. Secondly, Professor Grimm, the chief agent of the National Centre in Helsingfors and General Wrangel's official representative in Finland, stated to a colleague after the revolt had been crushed that if a new outbreak should occur then their group must not be caught unaware again. Average also notes that the revolt caught the émigrés off balance and that nothing had been done to implement the secret memorandum, and the warnings of the author were fully borne out." A 2003 bibliography by a historian of the Russian Civil War characterizes Average's history as "...the only full-length, scholarly, nonpartisan account of the genesis, course and repression of the rebellion to have appeared in English." Impact 
In 1939, Isaac Don Levine introduced Whitaker Chambers to Walter Kravitsky in New York City. First, Kravitsky asked, Is the Soviet government a fascist government? To which Chambers assented, You are right, and Kronstadt was the turning point. Chambers explained, from Kronstadt during the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, the sailors of the Baltic fleet had steamed their cruisers to aid the communists in capturing Petrograd. Their aid had been decisive. They were the first communists to realize their mistake and the first to try to correct it. When they saw that communism meant terror and tyranny, they called for the overthrow of the communist government and for a time imperiled it. They were bloodily destroyed or sent into Siberian slavery by communist troops led in person by the Commissar of War, Leon Trotsky, and by Marshal Tukhachevsky, one of whom was later assassinated, the other executed, by the regime they then saved. Kravitsky meant that by the decision to destroy the Kronstadt sailors, and by its cold-blooded action in doing so, communism had made the choice that changed it from benevolent socialism to malignant fascism. The 1949 book The God That Failed contains Louis Fisher's definition of Kronstadt as the moment in which communists or fellow travelers decide not just to leave the Communist Party but to oppose it as anti-communists. Editor Richard Crossman said in the book's introduction, The Kronstadt rebels called for Soviet power free from Bolshevik dominance. P. X. After describing the actual Kronstadt rebellion, Fischer spent many pages applying the concept to subsequent former communists, including himself. What counts decisively as the Kronstadt. Until its advent, one might waver emotionally or doubt intellectually or even reject the cause altogether in one's mind, and yet refuse to attack it. I had no Kronstadt for many years. P. 204. Topic. See also Left-wing uprisings against the Bolsheviks Russian battleship Potemkin Russian anarchism Hungarian Revolution of 1956 Prague Spring Naval Mutinies Spithead and Nor Mutinies Chilean Naval Mutiny of 1931 Royal Indian Navy Mutiny Kiel Mutiny HNLMS de Zevin Provincian 1909 Hashtag Mutiny in the Indies Invergordon Mutiny Revolt of the Lash Topic Notes Topic References Kronstadt, 1917 to 1921: The Fate of a Soviet Democracy. Israel Getzler, Cambridge University Press, 2002. ISBN 0-521-89442-5. Kronstadt, 1921: Paul Average, Princeton University Press. ISBN 0-691-08721-0. The Kronstadt Uprising of 1921, Lynn Thorndycraft, Left Bank Books, 1975 and 2012 The Russian Revolution and the Baltic Fleet, War and Politics, Evan Maudsley, London, 1978 Sailors in Revolt, The Russian Baltic Fleet in 1917, Norman Saul, Kansas, 1978 A History of Russia, N.V. Ryasinovsky, Oxford University Press USA, ISBN 0-19-515394-4 The Russian Revolution, W.H. Chamberlain, Princeton University Press ISBN 0-691-00816-7 Lenin, A Biography, Robert Service, Pan ISBN 0-330-49139-3 Lennon, Tony Cliff, London, Four Vols, 1975 to 1979. Red Victory, W. Bruce Lincoln, New York, 1989. Kronstadt, V. I. Lennon and Leon Trotsky, Pathfinder Press, ISBN 0-87348-883-0. The Unknown Revolution, Voline, Free Life Editions, New York, 1974. Reaction and Revolution, The Russian Revolution 1894-1924, Michael Lynch Kronstadtan Kapina 1921 Ja sen Periliset Suomessa Kronstadt Rebellion 1921 and its descendants in Finland, Erki Westman, Pilot Kustanis Oi, 2004, ISBN 952-464-213-1 Topic. 
External links Kronstadt Archive at Marxists.org Kronstadt 1921 in Russian the Kronstadt Izvestia online archive of the newspaper brought out by the rebels, including their list of demands Alexander Berkman The Kronstadt Rebellion Leon Trotsky Protests Too Much by Emma Goldman, a response to Trotsky's Hue and Cry over Kronstadt Kronstadt 1921 Bolshevism vs. Counterrevolution, Spartacist English Edition No. 59 International Communist League 4th Internationalist Ida Metz pamphlet of the Kronstadt Commune, originally published by Solidarity, UK. There is an extended discussion from an anarchist point of view in the anarchist FAQ. The Truth About Kronstadt, translation of the 1921 book Pravda o Kronstadt published in Prague by the socialist revolutionary newspaper Volia Rossi, and 1992 thesis, by Scott Zenkatsu Parker. New York Times archives of the ending of the rebellion. Kronstadt, Trotsky was right. Abby Bakken, Kronstadt and the Russian Revolution.